Hello, this is the second of two lectures on snow loads on structures. The topics addressed in this lecture, advanced snow loads, depend on your knowledge of basic snow loads. So if you haven't already, please uh, uh, take a look at the first of the two lectures before you dive into this one. So during the first lecture, we learned about ground snow loads in section 7.2, uh, flat roof snow loads in section 7.3, and sloped roof snow loads in section 7.4. The uh, topic of this presentation is going to be everything that you see down here in this lower right box where we talk about ed what I'm classifying as advanced topics such as partial loadings, unbalanced uh, loads, drifts on lower roofs, projection, sliding snow, and rain on snow surcharge. As a review from the first lecture, uh, step one would be to find the ground snow load. That's usually done by looking at maps. Uh, step two is to determine the structure coefficients, the exposure coefficient, thermal coefficient, and importance with respect to snow. After we have those, we determine the flat roof snow load, uh, 0.7 times C sub E times C sub T times I sub S times P sub G. Then, if needed, we determine the balanced sloped roof snow load, P sub S. And then finally, uh, we would look at examining partial loadings, uh, drifting, and, and other things that are addressed in this presentation. The first topic we'll deal with in this lecture is that of partial loading. In uh, some situations, you can get an uneven loading of uh, snow on the structure. Sometimes you get melting in one part of a structure relative to another. Sometimes the uh, uh, wind blows it around and uh, you end up with an uneven distribution of snow loads. In a lot of cases, that just reduces the stress in the members supporting the uh, portion of the roof where the snow is uh, of less intensity. But in other situations, having part of the roof loaded and the other part not can lead to a more critical situation than having the roof loaded uniformly. The intent isn't to require uh, the structural engineer to consider multiple checkerboard loadings, uh, but we do need to consider the possibility of, uh, of uh, having some spans in a continuous structure loaded to a uh, lower magnitude than others. So um, here are some common uh, applications of the partial loading. Here's a situation where snow is being removed from a structure. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what the background of this is, uh, why they would do it this way, but it does illustrate uh, the possibility of having a, uh, a partial loading on the roof. So the ASCE 7 specification or standard rather um, uh, states this. It says that the effect of having selected spans loaded with a balanced snow load and the remaining spans loaded with half of the balanced snow load shall be investigated. Um, we have three cases and case one is the full balanced snow load on either the exterior span and half the balanced snow load on all of the other spans. Case two says that we consider half the balanced snow load on either the exterior span and the full balanced snow load on the other spans. And then finally, case three, all possible combinations of full balanced snow load on any two adjacent spans and half the balanced snow load on all other spans. For this case, there will be N minus one possible combinations where N is the number of spans in the continuous beam system. Now to make uh, a little bit easier to digest, you would consider uh, these three cases graphically. So you have the full snow load in an exterior span with half the snow load in the other cases, case one, or other spans, case one. You have half the uh, snow load in the exterior span and the full snow load in the other spans, case two. And then you have uh, uh, case three illustrated there as well. If a, continue, if a cantilever beam is present in any one of the cases, it's counted as a span. And partial load provisions need not be applied to members that span perpendicular to the ridge line in gable roofs with a slope of 2.38 degrees or greater, so greater than a half inch uh, per foot. When you're dealing with other structural systems, structure, systems that are other than continuous beam systems, Areas sustaining only half the balanced snow load shall be chosen so as to produce the greatest effects on members being analyzed. 
The second topic of this lecture is unbalanced snow loads covered in section 7.6 of ASCE 7. Balanced and unbalanced loads shall be analyzed separately. Winds from all directions shall be accounted for when establish establishing the unbalanced loads. So this uh, figure illustrates the two different uh, types of loads. On the left, you see the balanced load, where this would be indicative of a snowfall in the absence of any real wind. So everything just falls uh, and settles in a balanced nature, if you will. The case on the right shows what happens if there's wind present. And in this case, it's illustrating the effects of wind blowing from left to right. So some of the snow that was originally present on the left side of the roof has blown over the, the peak uh, to the right side of the roof. So you can see the, uh, the original snowfall there, H sub G is in this case representing the balanced snow load, and then you have some uh, additional portion on top of that that represents the unbalanced part. So in the left, the balanced snow load, and uh, on the right, you have the unbalanced snow load. For hip and gable roof systems that either have a really steep slope or almost no slope at all, unbalanced snow loads uh, are not uh, required to be applied. So a steep slope is one that's uh, a 712 pitch or greater, and a uh, flat slope in this case is a uh, half inch per foot. Roofs with an eave to ridge distance of 20 feet or less, having simply supported prismatic members spanning from the ridge to the eave, shall be designed to resist an unbalanced uniform snow load on the leeward side equal to I sub S times P sub G. For these roofs, the windward side shall be unloaded. So let's illustrate that graphically. So here's the same structure illustrated twice. Uh, wind is blowing from left to right. So first we'll illustrate the balanced snow load. And this is where we put the sloped roof snow load P sub S on the horizontal projection of the roof. And uh, it's just applied as a uniform load, uh, balanced snow load. Now on the right, you can see the unbalanced snow load for this case when W is less than or equal to 20 feet with roof rafter systems. So in this case, uh, we would have wind blowing from left to right. So the left part of the roof here is the windward side. And the right part of the roof here is the leeward side. Those are two terms that you'll become very familiar with when we get to the uh, discussion of wind. For other gable roof systems, including uh, those of an uh, intermediate slope, you design for an unbalanced snow load that consists of 30% of P sub S on the windward side and one times P sub S on the leeward side, plus a rectangular surcharge that's equal to H sub D times gamma times the square root of S. H sub D is the drift height that's taken from figure 7.6-2. And in that figure, you need to use a value of L sub U that is defined as the windward uh, distance between the ridges and the eave. And for uh, values where W is less than 20 feet, use 20 feet in that figure. This unbalanced load is uh, illustrated on this slide. So again, we have the balanced load case on the left. And on the right, we show the unbalanced load. So you take a portion of the snow from the windward side to the left of the ridge, and it gets deposited on the leeward side to the right of the ridge by the process of the wind blowing. So in this uh, equation, gamma is the uh, unit weight of the snow, uh, taken as a maximum of 30 pounds per cubic foot. Um, yeah, and then, I'm sorry, S is defined as the, uh, the slope of the roof. And then finally, this is figure 7.6-2, where we determine the height of the drift, H sub D. Now, there are other roof types as well that are addressed in section 7.6. Um, uh, curved roofs are addressed on this slide in the next couple. And uh, the biggest factor in how we address this is what the slope of the roof is at the eaves. So in this case, we have a, a curved roof with a gentle slope. And you can see the balanced and the unbalanced uh, loads that are presented here. In both, case, both cases are presented on the horizontal projection of the roof, not the actual curved um, uh, profile of the roof. 
The same figures are presented in uh, ASCE 7. That's shown on the right. The figure on the left comes out of the Finella textbook. When we have curved curved roofs with an intermediate slope at the eaves between 70 and 30 degrees. Then we have a slightly different distribution of loads. The balanced snow load is shown there uh, and the unbalanced from the Finella text. And then these two figures coming out of ASCE 7 are shown here on the right. Again, for the uh, wind blowing left to right. Finally, when we have a roof that's rather steep at the eaves, uh, a, uh, a slope that is uh, greater than 70 degrees, then we have this situation where we have the balanced and the unbalanced snow load. Um, and then the same figure coming out of ASCE 7. Now I should mention for the uh, uh, second and the third case, there's a slightly different uh, unbalanced snow load that's presented for the case where you don't have much of a wall present. In other words, where this distance here, come on now, get the marker to work is relatively small. Um, so in some cases you can have a structure where the roof is continuously curved all the way down to the ground level. And in those cases, there's a slightly different value for, or a slightly different profile for the unbalanced snow loads, but that's beyond the scope of what uh, we're going to cover in this class. Finally, um, there are also folded plate roofs or sawtooth roofs, and they have a different uh, version or different uh, profile for the unbalanced snow loads. And those are shown here. So uh, in the uh, first uh, image, this is the, uh, the roof profile here. And um, then you can see on the horizontal projection of that roof profile, you have the uh, balanced snow load and then the unbalanced snow load. And the idea is that in a case like this, you are going to account for the possibility that you have uh, snow that accumulates here in these valleys and leads to an uneven distribution of load. The next topic that we'll address is that in section 7.7 .7 of drifts that form on lower roofs. It says that roofs shall be designed to sustain localized loads from snow drifts that form in the wind shadow or aerodynamic shade of higher portions of the same structure or adjacent structures and terrain features. So here is a single structure with a stepped roof feature. So the roof is higher on the left than it is on the right. And you can get a snow drift that forms uh, next to that uh, step. So you see the balanced snow load there represented with dots. And then you see the, uh, the surcharge or the additional load that's uh, present because of the drift. Now, snow that forms drifts uh, from a higher roof uh, can come, uh, can be formed from wind blowing in either direction. So uh, in this case, we show a, uh, a feature, maybe a, a building or a uh, mechanical shack on the roof of a building with the wind blowing from left to right. So you can get a snow drift that forms on the windward side of that feature, or you could get a drift that forms on the leeward side of that feature. Now these drifts aren't identical, they're different. You can see that there's a notch there on the windward drift because of the aerodynamic action of the wind, but they are very similar. If we go back and look at this uh, building again, then uh, this drift that is formed there could form either from wind blowing from left to right. In that case, it would be a leeward drift because the step is on the leeward side of the, uh, of the elevated feature or that drift could form uh, from wind blowing right to left, in which case it would be a windward drift. And then you can see the two different fetches that are illustrated at the bottom. So basically the idea of a fetch is that it's the distance that the wind uh, blows across something and carries it. So in the case of uh, wind blowing from left to right, then what's going to happen is it's going, the wind is going to carry snow from this portion and it's going to deposit it there. In the case of wind blowing from right to left, then the wind is going to carry snow from here and it's going to deposit it there. This uh, is just a picture that shows the uh, phenomenon that we're discussing. This is some type of a mechanical shack on the uh, roof of a structure. Maybe this has the elevator machinery in it or maybe the HVAC. It looks rather decrepit in any case. But uh, you can see the, the uh, snow drift that is formed here, and we need to account for the weight that that snow drift exerts on the roof of the structure. 
This slide illustrates the geometry of the snow drifts that uh, we're examining here. So um, again, this drift that's illustrated here could be the result from a windward drift or a leeward drift. Um, but the geometry that we're uh, illustrating here is, uh, is basically this. L sub u is the uh, length of the fetch that's used in determining how big the snow drift is going to be. This uh, value of h sub b is the height of the balanced snow load that would exist in the absence of any wind. This value of h sub c is the clear height that's measured from the top of the upper portion of the, uh, the feature that creates a snow drift and the top of the balanced snow load. So we refer to that as a clear height, h sub c. Then we have the height of the drift, h sub d, that's illustrated there. And then correspondingly, the magnitude of the load intensity that comes from that snow drift, p sub d. And then finally, you have this value here, w, that illustrates the width of the snow drift uh, on the lower part of the roof. For leeward drifts, the drift height, h sub d, is determined directly from figure 7.6-1 using the length of the upper roof as the fetch. For windward drifts, the drift height is determined by substituting in the length of the lower roof in figure 7.6-1 and then using three quarters of the height from that chart. The larger of these two heights is the height that you use for your design. If the height of the snow drift that you get from figure 7.6-1 is less than the clear height, then the drift width w is equal to four times the height, and the drift height shall be taken as uh, h sub d from the figure. However, in some cases, the drift height can exceed the clear height, h sub c, and in that case, the width w is equal to four times h sub d squared divided by h sub c, and the drift height is equal to h sub c. The drift width w is never greater than 8 times h sub c, however, and if the drift width w exceeds the width of the lower roof, then the drift is truncated at the far edge of the roof. It's not reduced to a value of zero at that point. The maximum intensity of the drift surcharge load, p sub d, is equal to h sub d times gamma, where gamma is equal to 13% of the ground snow load, p sub g, plus 14 pounds per cubic foot, but is never taken as greater than 30 pounds per cubic foot. So gamma is equal to 0.13 times p sub g plus 14, but never greater than 30. This density uh, shall also be used in determining h sub b by dividing p sub s by gamma. Section 7.8 covers drifts uh, due to roof projections and parapets as well. And the, the method in section 7.7 is used with some modifications. The height of the drifts from roof projections and parapets is taken as three quarters times H sub D. And for parapet walls, uh, the value of L sub U is taken as the length of the roof upwind from the wall. For roof projections, L sub u is taken equal to the greater of the length of the roof upwind or downwind from the projection. And if the side of the roof projection is less than 15 feet long, then you don't need to consider drifts around that particular projection. We can also get drift due to adjacent structures, not, the, uh, not necessarily the building you're designing, but a building that's an a, a entirely separate structure. If the horizontal distance between the adjacent structures is less than 20 feet and less than six times the vertical separation distance, then the requirements for the leeward drift in section 7.7 are used to determine the drift on the lower structure. The height of the snow drift is a smaller of h sub d based on the length of the adjacent higher structure and 6h minus s divided by 6. The horizontal extent of the drift shall be the smaller of either 6 times h sub d or 6h minus s. For windward drifts, requirements of section 7.7 are also used and the resulting drift is permitted to be truncated. So the information on the previous slide is a lot to absorb in words. So here's the same information shown graphically. So the structure on the right is the structure that's being considered for snow loads. We have a wind blowing from left to right across an adjacent structure and you can see how the formation of this uh, 
snowdrift shown here is the result of the uh, wind blowing off of the adjacent structure. So that would be a leeward snowdrift. On the other hand, with wind blowing from right to left, you end up with a windward snowdrift instead. Okay, the potential exists for snow to slide off of other roof sections or other roof segments onto a, a lower roof, and we need to account for that as well. The, the load caused by snow sliding off a sloped roof onto a lower roof shall be determined for slippery upper roofs with slopes greater than a quarter inch per foot, and for other roofs, non-slippery roofs, with slopes greater than two inches per foot. The total sliding load per unit length of eave shall be 0.4 times p sub f times w, where w is a horizontal distance from the eave to the ridge for the sloped upper roof. And the sliding load shall be distributed uniformly on the lower roof over a distance of 15 feet from the upper roof eave. If the width of the lower roof is less than 15 feet, then the sliding, sliding load shall be distributed proportionally. So this illustrates that uh, graphically. So there's the upper roof where you have a value of P sub F. And the, uh, the idea here is that the potential exists for snow to slide off of the roof here and then be deposited onto this lower roof over a width of 15 feet. Okay, um, it could come off of an adjacent structure as well. And uh, in this case, uh, you have to consider the gap between the two structures. So you have a, a, a spacing uh, S less than 15 feet. So the potential exists that you could end up with some of the snow that slides off at some velocity that's great enough to span that gap and be deposited on the adjacent structure. Okay, finally, uh, in some cases we deal with uh, the possibility of having a snowstorm that's followed by rain. And uh, we refer to this as rain on snow surcharge. And the idea is that if you have a snowstorm and then the temperature increases and it rains afterwards, the water that would normally drain off of a roof is sometimes absorbed or trapped by the snow and you end up with a higher load than you would from either the rain or the snow acting alone. So for locations where the ground snow load is 20 pounds per square foot or less, but not zero, all roofs with slopes uh, less than W over 50 uh, shall include a five pounds per square foot rain on snow surcharge load. This additional load only applies to a uh, sloped roof load case, a balanced load case, and need not be used in combination with drifts, sliding snow, unbalanced loads, minimum loads, or partial loads. Now, chapter seven of ASCE seven doesn't deal with ice directly, uh, but I'm gonna mention it here. I think it's chapter 10. Uh, yeah, that's in the next uh, next bullet item. Chapter 10 deals with uh, ice, but uh, you do need to be aware that uh, ice can form on structures and the weight of the ice itself can be uh, uh, quite substantial in some cases. This is probably more true for metal structures with exposed steel or exposed metal, um, things like antennas or transmission lines and things of that nature. Not only must the weight of the ice be considered, but after the uh, ice forms on the structure, you can end up with more exposure for wind. So the wind blowing on a transmission tower might not be a problem. The weight of the ice on the transmission tower by itself might not be a problem, but you could have ice form on a transmission tower, then have wind blow, and then uh, wind blowing on that ice could lead to problems with a, a transmission tower or some type of a similar type of structure. Anyways, uh, not, not something I'm gonna cover in, in depth here, but I wanted to mention it here since we're talking about uh, rain, snow, and ice. Another situation that is addressed in section um, uh, chapter seven is uh, that of ice dams. And uh, this potential, the potential exists for an ice dam to form when uh, water flows, uh, when snow falls on a warm roof, it turns into water, and then it drains over a colder portion of the roof and then freezes. So the details are illustrated here in uh, text. But I think the next slide shows it uh, graphically. So here's the idea of a, uh, an ice dam illustrated graphically. 
And the idea is you end up with uh, snow that falls down here on this roof. You end up with some melting occurring um, because it's a warm roof. So the, uh, the melt water flows down here. But in this region, the roof isn't heated, so it's cold. So then the melt water freezes again. And then you end up with uh, this block of ice uh, out here that forms a dam and traps adjacent water. So the weight of that water can be substantial. The weight of the ice can be substantial. And in situations like this, you need to account for that extra weight at the eaves. OK, that brings us to the end of this lecture and uh, the end of the coverage that we're going to have for uh, snow loads in this class. So at this point, you should be able to calculate the uh, flat roof snow load, uh, a sloped roof balanced snow load, an unbalanced snow load for sloped roofs. And you should be able to address things like uh, drifting, um, uh, sliding snow, and things of that nature. OK, thanks.